चैटर्जी डॉक्टर चौधरी डॉक्टर वर्मा डॉक्टर गुप्त जी लास्ट बट नॉट द लिस्ट माय होस्ट एंड माय गार्डियन हियर श्री रजोत कुमार मिश्र जी लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आई हैव नेवर फेल्ट so awkward in my life in any gathering as i feel today in such lyrical amidst such lyrical presentation of beautiful words in hindi i am unfortunate that i am speaking in english some people do not have the knack for learning many languages although i can read and understand hindi quite well but i do not have the audacity to speak in that language where such wonderful speakers are there something very good i think i managed it what ah you are not this say i think you can all hear me no with this i think that is better topics that are chosen are always concerning the current life technology management stay strain sociological political subjects that there are some people who wish to hear on myths and legends it was a pleasant surprise for me i do not have any academic claim to the study of myths and legends but my presentation will be entirely is a student of literature and mysticism man is the only creature as you know who lives at the same time on three planes of time simultaneously we carry the burden of the memories of the past we are struggling through the present we look at the future with anxiety as well as expectations with the dreams and trepidations of heart we do not know what is there tomorrow what is there very next moment all the three times we carry simultaneously scientists and psychologists say that no other creature is burdened with three times except man naturally the present is a continuous of the past and at no time we are without the past undoubtedly much of the past we must mercilessly leave behind but the experience of the past the great lessons which have been gained by mighty great thinkers of the past which remain present which are given to us which pass on to us as myths and legends we must not ignore them we must try to learn from them well let us discuss briefly what is the scope of this legends and myths what is a myth and what is a legend both myth and legend are in their form stories because they are stories they remain alive for centuries they have a gripping hold of the human attention human mind so much so that a timeless quality is the prime virtue of a great work of mythology myths are stories charged with experience and such very valuable lessons mythology is the compendium the collection of myths now ramayana is one such mythological work i remember a small incident which took place some years ago i was told in bombay now there is a young entrepreneur a young industrialist but the moment he comes back from his workshop to the home he is a little lovely little 12 year old boy a son he just plays with him and talks to him and asks the boy what did you learn today in the school 
And one day, when he came back from his workshop, he asked the boy, what did you learn today in the school? Generally, the boy very spontaneously reports what he has learned, but that day he avoided it. Oh, father, don't bother about it. I mean, it would be interesting to you. Now, please tell me, what did you learn today in the school? When he insisted, the boy said, well, our teacher, our didi, my, our teacher is called their didi in their particular school, she told us a story called Ramayana, but you would like it. And the father is a little surprised. <coughs> Ramayana, tell me the story, I would like to hear it. Oh no, father, I tell you, you would like it. No, please tell me, the father says. All right, the son says. The hero and heroine go for a picnic to the forest. The villain comes and kidnaps the heroine. The hero sends an SOS to his friends and they come and they rescue the heroine. And the father says, this is the story of Ramayana your teacher told you? And then comes the revealing point. The son says, father, what the teacher told us, if I narrate that to you, you would believe it. The son, I like it very much, the son says, it's a wonderful story, but you won't believe it. In other words, the son thinks that the father who is a materialist, who is busy with his business, busy with his very realistic, matter of fact work, he can't appreciate the beauty of Ramayana, though the child has appreciated it. So he has edited the story and is produced in modern terms for the Ramayana is for his other benefit, which means that even though the child is born in a very, very modern milieu, but Ramayana continues to be absorbingly interesting to him. He pities his father that he may not have the capacity to appreciate it. Now, both stories and both myths and legends claim to be based or rooted somehow in history. But while Legends are rooted to factual history. Myths may not belong to the factual history because it is believed by great seers that the reality is not confined to our gross physical plane. There are hundreds of influences around us, factors and forces molding our life, unpredictable interventions come to our life, <laughs> out of these myths and legends which might have taken place on the physical plane or some other plane, traditions are born, phrases are there. For example, when we speak in our daily speech, Oti Gorpe Hotolanka, we are remembering the entire story of Ramayana and how Ravana, being proud, lost everything. His kingdom became completely bankrupt and destroyed. When we speak, you see, sometimes myths create a particular tradition which becomes inseparable from the national psyche, from the entire heritage. You know, today we are speaking of feminism, the women's liber liberation, but who was the first feminist in Indian culture? At the dawn of humanity, when humanity was created through the daughters of King Dakya, according to our myth, he had hundred daughters. And at that time, humanity had not yet come to existence. They were married to the gods. The youngest one chose Lord Sivo. Sati is her name. She chose for her husband, Lord Sivo, to which Dakya would not give his consent. Shiva lives like a tramp. He does not have even a roof on his house. He does not have good clothes. For ornament he puts a snake. For, in place of wonderful silken clothes, he puts a tiger skin. How can you, my daughter, my princess, can live with him? But Swati revolted against her father and went and married Shiva the first feminist movement, and it is not confined to that only. She look at Sati's character there, while she is there in Kailas along with Sivo. One day, 
the divinely notorious Narado arrives there and reports to her, asks her, how are you here? Your father is organizing a wonderful jagya. All your sisters, all your brothers-in-law are there. You are here. Immediately, Swati stands up and says, I'll go. Shiva forbids her from taking such a step. Uninvited, one should not go anywhere. You have not been invited by your father. <coughs> He's deliberately avoided you. How can you go there? Then comes Swati's statement, which became an unwritten law in Indian heritage. She said, at no point of time, day, night, or any month, a daughter's admission, admittance into the father's house can be forbidden. A daughter has the right, no question of invitation, any moment to enter the parent's house. And that became, an, according to sociologists, Indologists, for thousands of years, an unwritten law of Indian tradition. That the word like Tyajya Putra, a father can disown a son. No word is there as Tyajya Kanya. You cannot disown a daughter. So sometimes, whether the myth is derived from something that happened either at the physical plane or some other plane, but its impact on the society and the mind of a nation can be very, very great. All great world civilizations have their myths, Chaldean, Babylonian, Chinese, Egyptian, Greco-Roman, and Indian. Today, all over the world, only two mythologies are alive. Through phrases and proverbs, Greco-Roman mythology is available. I mean, that's alive. But Indian myths are vibrant with life. Every Indian festival is linked with some kind of a mythical event. Every second or third Indian is named after one of the mythical characters, be it a woman character or a man character. And myths sometimes remind us of their cautions, their warnings, their compressed wisdom. All over the world, let us take, a, for example, Pandora's box, a Greek, Greco-Roman uh, proverb. What is the Pandora's box? <laughs> Demigods, you know, there is always some kind of a relationship of jealousy and envy between human beings who are evolving, progressing, and the lesser category of supernatural beings who are all of, often depicted as gods, but they are not god demigods. They are not the divine emanations. They are the, between man and the supreme. There are many, many layers, many, many possibilities, many, many occult beings, many forces. So such gods, they're envious of man because man has learned how to use fire. So they create a damsel, a beautiful girl, each demigod giving a particular quality to the girl, and they prepare an ivory box and send the girl to marry, tempt Prometheus, the person who had brought fire from gods to man. But Prometheus means poor knowledge, who knows things beforehand. Now when Pandora comes carrying the box with the dowry, the world's first instance of dowry, the dowry system was not there in India. When Savitri goes to marry Satyavar and live in the forest, no question of dowry was there. Anyway, when so Pandora comes with the first dowry, Prometheus refuses to open it and he does not entertain her. She goes to Epimetheus, the brother of Prometheus. Epimetheus literally means afterthought. That is who part acts and then thinks whether I did right or wrong. So Epimetheus married her and the box was opened. Instantly out of that box spring out miseries, sufferings, DJS, hundreds of evils, little imps, little devils come out of them. They are horrified, but they can't close the box any longer. Last to come out was hope, asa. And you see how psychologically profound is this legend. Despite all our sufferings, problems of life, what sustains us 
is the who prepared from this quality grapes how oh, what a feast i will have that day there was a slave working in the garden a wise man he is making a remark alas my lord will not remain alive till then somebody reports this to enias enias comes back to his room calls the slave did you say this that i won't be alive to test the cup of wine to be prepared for my quality grapes yes my lord i did say all right we will see he could have killed the slave but he wants to kill him with torture after he has been proved to be wrong the grapes ripe ripe when grapes are crushed the first cup of wine is met and the wine is brought to enias and presented in front of him then he calls the servant the slave come he comes you remember what you said yes my lord now here is the cup of wine and i am going to drink it what have you to say now and he says my lord there is many a slip between the cup and the lip anything can happen before the cup touches your lip he has said this much another servant comes running and informs enias my lord a wild boar has come and is destroying the vineyard he did so he shuts down the cup and goes to kill the boar and himself gets killed the cup of wine remains untouched by his lip so a great wisdom that life is unpredictable any moment anything can happen for a man who solely depends on his own intelligence or his own endeavor or his own capacity or his own talent there is no human being who can really entirely control the forces that go to mold our life or mold our tomorrow now these are myths legends are many kinds there are mythological legends there are historical legends there are legends attributed to history there are legends promoted folk tales <clears throat> promoted to the rank of legends time would not permit me to give all the illustrations but let me give a few sample surveys before you now what is a mythological legend see the significance the legend will appear to be a ordinary folk tale it is not so now suppose the legend is kanyakumari kanyakumari many of you must have visited tap camorin it used to be called during british days at the lens end of india once upon a time there was a terrible demon called banasuro and he was creating havoc among the localities people prayed to divine mother do something to save us so divine mother is born as a princess in the pandu raj family the capital of which was at that time kanyakumari and she grew up a wondrous character a beautiful girl and now the king started wondering how who where to find the eligible beds for my daughter and when the daughter heard this she told the father my dear father don't worry about my wedding no but you must wait all right you fix up the wedding date and time my bridegroom will come and he will take me along with him she sat down to invoke lord shiva because she was the divine mother she could not have married any other human mortal so at of the koilas entranced meditative shivas trance is broken he knows it is time for him to come and take his celestial consort away to koilas he starts walking now here comes the folk element now now the sages are worried if shiva comes and takes this princess away who is going to kill banasuro our entire 
purpose of meditation in invoking her to be born as a human being is defeated. So again, Narada possessed a cock. Ah, uh, and midnight when Shiva is about to reach Kanyakumari, he started making cock a total do. The cocks cry. Shiva suddenly thought it is early morning. The midnight time has passed. Desperate, he sat down on a stone. And the moment Shiva sits down, he enters trance. Samadhi Avastha. There, the moment passed away. And Banasura meanwhile heard that the princess is being married to somebody. He comes in a few bounds and enters the palace to forcibly take her away. Nobody can check his entry. Nobody can face this terrible demon. And as he enters and goes to the chamber itself where the bride was seated, she simply pulls a sword out of her bodyguard's seat and beheads him. Banasura is finished. But what about Kanyakumari? She's still waiting, looking at the east, symbol of hope, waiting for the day when Lord Shiva will come and take her away. Mystics say India is a, not a piece of heart, it is a consciousness. At the top of the consciousness remains Shiva, at the bottom, Shakti, meditating and trying to invoke the grace of Lord Shiva. One day they will unite it. That will be the glorious day for India. India, the consciousness, will awake on that day. How futuristic elements are there in such means. This is an example of a mythological legend which has become a myth. Now, there can be purely a folk tale which assumes the status of legend because the message it carries. I will give an example of one such legend one such folk tale practically, which I believe all of you know. According to my research, its origin was Punjab. Now the myth is like this. Two persons in the winter, they are, well, a bit, uh, <coughs> it's a bit cold. But they are quite affluent people. Suddenly one of them sees that the river is full of flood. It's a monsoon time, the river is in spate and a blanket is floating away. So one of them said, I will jump and catch the blanket and bring it ashore. The other one says, you don't lack blankets. In your house there are hundred blankets. Why do you want another blanket? No, no, how can I see what appears to be quite a costly blanket just going away? He jumps, tries to catch the blanket, but both blanket and he are seen being swept by the river. The other man shouts, I leave the blanket and come back. Then he says, I have left the blanket, but the blanket is not leaving me. The blanket was a bear, a balu, a bear which has fallen into the river. And now he has got hold of this man. He don't leave. What a pathetic story. But what is the significance? It is a wonderful mystic comment. We all are looking for happiness, undoubtedly, more and more comfort. And money, wealth is a means of our... You see, all the distorted, all the qualities of God are present in us. But in our ignorance, they have been distorted. It's an important mystic truth we have to remember. A human being is a projection of God. But God passing through ignorance, resulting in this human being, all the divine qualities have become distorted and perverted in our character. One of the attributes of God is freedom. He is supremely free. We want to become freedom, free, completely free, free from ignorance, free from our miseries, free from every kind of obstacle. Money is a means of freedom. If I have more money, I am more free to do whatever I like. I have two cars. If I have more money, I want the latest car to buy. I have more money. I can spend by summer in Switzerland. Now, I am free to do whatever I like. But in the process of looking for this freedom, money is the means. 
I do not know when I enslave myself to the means. The means become my master and the real purpose is forgotten. Money becomes my master and the means, the, the purpose of money is a means for freedom that is completely forgotten. Psychologically it results in a disease called acquisitiveness. There are people who till the last moment of their life only acquire and acquire and acquire. Statistically, they can be sold that even if you try to spend a million dollars a day, you can't exhaust your treasure before you are already 80 years or 90 years before you die. Even then, it is a disease. So how? This is the spoke tale promoted to the level of a legend because of the mighty great truth that when one wants something for which one does not have real need, and he becomes enslaved by the means for something which is looking for. Coming back to means proper. You see, there are, it seems, there are two planes of time. What I mean by two planes of time. One is a calendarical time, chronological time, 18th century giving with 19th century, 19th century giving you to 20th century, 20th century coming to 21st century. This is one course of time. The other is the calendar of consciousness. Two calendars, chronological calendar and the calendar of consciousness. A great truth may descend into a highly enlightened consciousness and it may take hundreds of years for humanity to absorb it. Now, Coming to proper myth, the myth of Mandapya. One day at midnight from the king's palace, some valuable treasures have been stolen. Immediately the king has come to know about it. And he summons his chief Kotwal and tells him that before sunrise, both the stolen booty, the treasure, and the culprit must be produced before me. Otherwise, you and your staff will be beheaded. In those days, it was possible. The Kotwal and his staff, they spread over the city. The thief, the burglar has become also quite nervous. So he has left the treasure which he has stolen inside a hut where says Mandapya was seated in meditation. He lives it behind him and hides. The Kotwal finds out the treasure and arrests the hermit and produces before the king the treasure and the hermit. By that time the king is sleepy. He does not look at the hermit. He says, if you have found the treasure along with the man, execute him. Executing a person in those days meant putting him on a spike, so low. The man will sink through the spike an excruciating painful death at mid, uh, I mean before morning or around the time of morning, it generally take one hour for one to die. The says Mandavi was put on the spike. And after a couple of hours, the Kotwal came to throw away the dead body. But the sage was blinking. He was looking at everybody as if nothing has happened. On the Sulo, he's seated in the Sulo. Sulo has already crept through his body and was trying to come out of his head. He is surprised. A kind of eerie feeling comes to him. He waits for some more time. There are some people who have got gutter stamina. Probably he is one of them. He waits for some more time. But by afternoon the same thing. By evening the same thing. Now a nervous Kotwal goes to the king and says, My Lord, I believe we have made a blunder. This cannot be the Meanwhile, people have come and told the Kotwal, what have you done? He says Mandapyo, Rishi Mandapyo, you have mistaken him to be a burglar. The king himself comes out, brings Mandapyo out of the spike, and the king prostrates himself before him and says, Oh Rishi, pardon this criminal, I have done what I should not, I could not have done in my ignorance, in my stupidity. Please pardon, the Rishi does not say anything. Several Puranas say, he started walking. The king is crying and following, please pardon me, speak a word. 
then there is a dance towards him and says, you foolish king, do you think you could have caused this excruciating pain, this anguish to me? You have the right to do it. You have the capacity to do it. The king does not understand anything. He stops, says, goes to the street, to the god of dharma, who is also Jama, god of death. It is a strange concept that the god of death also is a god of dharma. So he go goes there and asks him, why was I required to pass through this painful stage of my life? Apologetic God of Dharma says, when you were a little child, you had driven a needle, a nail through a butterfly. So you had to suffer the consequence of the spike being driven through your body. Till then, says Mandapya was quite calm and quiet. Then his fury burst forth. What? What I had done as a completely unconscious child for that the conscious I must suffer. And then mastering his top of Shakti, the power of Askesis, the power of his sadhana, his yoga, which he threw into the atmosphere and declared, from today the law must change. It is not the action, but the motive behind the action which will determine the quantum of punishment to be given to a person. And a child who is not yet adult cannot be treated in the same way like an adult committing a crime. Thousands of years Mandapya declared this. How many centuries Indian penal code and penal courts all over the world took to imbibe it and to codify it as a civil and civilized system of law. So, to one consciousness, a great truth may come much earlier and for the collective humanity to absorb it, to receive it and to practically make it a part of their life, it may take many, many centuries. That is the J.B.S. Halden, the great scientist, who spent his last days in Bhuvanesh of the capital of my home state, one of the top most scientists of 20th century. He comments on one of the Indian parables. He says it's astonishingly scientific. What is that? The myth of ten incarnations. <laughs> Nowhere in the world's mythology that the futuristic myth like this ten avatars. And as you, many of you know, it is extremely symbolic, too symbolic to be dismissed simply as a story or a fantasy. Avatar means a descent. Though everything remains involved in this creation. Just for example, the flower remains involved in the seed. But unless there is a descent of the sunlight or the air, the seed cannot keep out into a living, I mean, plant, <coughs> resulting in a flower. So, while everything is there in the Srishti, the Srishti term is very beautiful, but I won't go into these things. Now, intervention is necessary, a descent, avataran, what is known as avatar. So, the avatar, first avatar is matsya, the stirring of life in water. Then comes kurma, Bridge between the water and the land. Braha, still linked with the water, but a mighty life force released, a vitality, a physical capacity. It paves its own way on this earth. Then comes the bridge between the animal creation and human creation, symbolic. Man, lion, nourishing her. Then comes the primeval, undeveloped human being, the dwarf, the Bhamana full fledged human being in Parasurama, now with a Parasu in his hand, an axe, that is to say, symbolizing mastery, man's mastery over his environment. But, till then, avatars came one after another with some intervals. While Parasurama is alive, Rama comes, the avatar of ethics and morality, 
because power without ethics is dangerous. Professor has already proved that. And so, Ramo comes and significantly, the first meeting, Professor Ramo surrenders his avatar to Ramo. Thereafter, Professor Ramo is no longer an avatar. He has surrendered whatever he had, the great mystic power to Ramo, the one avatar of ethical values and one lifetime. How many codes of conduct he kept the society? And what a mighty epic, you see, India luckily had a strange group of creators of its civilization, which no other nation had, Rishis, a phenomenal strange community. Look into our literature, Balmik and Vyasa, both poets are Rishis, beginning of Indian literature. Look into great tapasis like Augustyo. Look into Vasistha. Look into the great, even musicians, Arpadic philosophers. They are all Rishis. The entire civilization has been created by a strange group of people called Rishis. Anyway, Paras Rama remains there after the Rishi, no longer an avatar. And Rama, in his lifetime, shares examples of codes of conduct, father's relationship with the son, king's relationship with the subject, brother's relationship with the brothers, Husbands responsible towards the wife. Uttarakhand is not by Balmiki. Uttarakhand, Sita's exile. Do not confuse. Let us not give judgment on Balmiki. This that is that is something which is much different and written afterwards. But I must admit, Uttarakhand also is written by a great satirist. Sita, who had emerged from the mother earth and was kept in the custody of father incarnate Janaka which means father, a father consciousness, was given to the custody of Ramo, the divine incarnation, yet was stolen by the hostile forces. They are so crafty. Ravana representing the evil, darker forces. They are so crafty. They are so clever. In spite of all these precautions, he had taken away Sita. But Rama fought and rescued her. Humanity did not deserve her. After all this, the suspicions which are cast on her character. You remember, many people, the other day I was reading a thesis prepared by a Western scholar. It came to me for review. And where calmly she, she says, am I going too long? Are you bored? Should I continue? Another few minutes. Now, the review says, the Indian womanhood under the influence of Sita, remained a timid lot. What an understanding of Sita's character. Ramayana should be called Sitayana actually. Every turn of Ramayana is because of Sita's will. Nobody has asked her to follow Rama into the forest. She does it. When Rama sees the golden, Sita sees golden deer, it is she who sends Rama after it. And what a wisdom Sita has. In one of the, the early Kandos, you will see, or in the Kando, when Ramo is in the forest and many rishis are coming to him and pleading with him that please save us from the hands of the demons, Ramo says, Yes, I have been given this bow and these arrows to destroy all these demons. Two, three delegations have been assured like this when they depart. What a wonderful! Dialogue between Sita and Rama. Sita says, Arya Putra, I want to tell you a story. Rama looks at her. She says, once upon a time, there was a young sage. She became so much powerful with Tapasya that Indra quietly came one day instead of sending in a name to dance before him. What Indra did was a very psychological step he took. He put a simple glittering sword in front of him. And between after, when an interval between his two spells of tapasya came, he looked at the sword, looked very charming, he touched it. After some time, he unsheathed the sword. Next time, he applied it on the bush, which was near by a plant. He was fascinated by the capacity of the sword. Fourth time, a deer came near him. He killed the deer. 
thereafter he handled the sword and went on killing people. After his death, Sita concludes, she is a straight plunge into hell. Aryaputra, just as he was possessed by the sword, I hope you are not possessed by your bow and your arrows. Every material object has an aura of its own, a power of its own radiating. And unless a human being is a well-defined personality, he can any moment come under the influence of the environment, circumstances and situations, vibrations in the atmosphere. This is the Sita, the wise Sita. How can she be an example of timidity? It is Sita who asks Rama to go after the golden deer. What a comment the poets make. Asambhava haima mrigasya zalma tathapi rama lulubhya mrigaya Toya samapanna vipatti kale dhiyo sapungsa marina bhavanti A golden deer is impossible. Yet Rama pursues the golden deer. When a moment of crisis comes, the genius of even the intelligent people become blood. So it is Sita. Again, Lakshmana is compelled by Sita to go away in such when Rama, I mean when, when Manisha gives the false cry. Ravana kidnaps her, Hanuman meets her, requests her, come, sit on my back, I will take you home to your husband. Ravana has stolen me. If you also on my behalf, behalf of my husband steal me, what the difference between Ravana and Rama? So, the war must take place. My husband must possibly defeat the enemy and take me victorious. And then when Rama, like you see, we have to see, an avatar comes with a certain purpose. An avatar comes not with a complete spiritual and divine consciousness always present in her. He is evolving with humanity. We have to remember the meaning of avatar. A Vatsyare Kurma could not be expected to become always omniscient, omnipresent and omnipotent. No. It is a limited role which he prescribes for himself and comes down. So Rama as a human being is wondering what the people of Jodhya will say when after having lived in Ravana's palace for so many days, you will be back as the queen. It is Sita who orders for the Agni Parikya. The mistaken belief is, as if Rama asked her to go into Agni Parikya, she, she commands Lakshmana to arrange for this a spellbound, hypnotized, everybody seated stunned, and she enters the Agni. The fire cannot destroy her because she is as pure as the flames of fire herself. And she marches unscathed. And that is where Agni Prana gives an interpretation that real Sita was kept by Agni herself, himself, when this, and it was an imitation Sita, a duplicate, a, a cloned Sita, you can say, who was present in Ravana, and now this new Sita, the real Sita came out of Agni. But whatever it is, what I wanted to say, that when Sita in Uttarakhand, Sita is being asked once again to appear in Agni Parikya, why should she? First time it was out of her free will she did it. Now to satisfy the riffraff, the people who are ignorant, stupid, they are coming for to satisfy them. Populism was not there. She was not a politician. To satisfy them, she would enter Agni Pariksha. Better she goes back from where she had come. Mother Earth divides and takes her away. So that is a great satire on humanity that we did not deserve Sita. And that is why she had to go back. These are great lessons from myths and legends which are absolutely relevant for our life even today. Now, take the case of Rama. Then after that comes the mighty great, the supreme wisdom of Hidartu known till today, the genius of Krishna. And I need not, there is own time, I need not go into that. You all know about Krishna's role in life. Till today, the evolution is proceeding in a straight line. Consciousness is growing. With Krishna, man has been expected to be wise enough to realize what he says. 
But suppose I become disgusted with my life and says, no, I don't want this punarapijanamam, punarapimaranam, punarapijananijasare sayanam. I want to go back from the source from which I came. Freedom must be given to humanity. Buddha comes. Here is the way of Nirvana. You can embrace it and go away. But that is not the ultimate solution to the problem of this creation. Why did God create this man? If in this half animal, half human stage, <coughs> only thing we can do is to depart, escape from the world and cease from the cycle of birth and death. There must be a fulfillment to this creation. A waiting. Kalki comes, the tenth avatar. As I said, the only futuristic myth in the world's history of mythology is this ten avatar, where the end is set in the future. A day will come, the new incarnation of Vishnu's colleague would come and finish up the barbaric. If individually he kills barbaric, nobody will survive the operation. What is meant here is annihilating the barbaric element in human consciousness. The barbaric man will come to an end and a new humanity would be created. A wonderful promise, a tremendous hope which alone can justify creation. Otherwise, the entire civilization has no meaning if escape into Nirvana could be the only solution. That is an option given to people who want it. Now, I would not delve deeper into it. Another few minutes I must finish. You will see that there are five goals which we are pursuing from the times in memorial. We want to know what is God. God, light. Light means knowledge. Sri Aurobindo, in his life divine, first chapter he says, there are five goals humanity is pursuing since the dawn of his consciousness. God, light, freedom, bliss, immortality. Freedom. What is freedom? From the very birth a child is trying to be free from any kind of inability, incapacity. He's struggling to stand up, falling down, but he wants to free in his movement. So the very instinctive ask for freedom, bliss and immortality. Each of these goals can be detailed explained with examples. I will just take up as a symbolic for a few minutes the last one, quest for immortality. God is immortal, as his protesa, as his projections. Why should we arbitrarily submit ourselves to death? That is a question. And how to find the secret of immortality? Samudra Mantra is the first instance of nectar must be discovered. You know the story, I would not go into it. It's a magnificent myth. Then comes a time, the story, the Life of Lachiketa that says Pajasravas is performing a Yajna and he is giving away everything that he had including an emaciated cow. The little Lachiketa thinks that well I too belong to my father. Has he forgotten to give me away? He goes and asks that I see, father whom did you give me away? Father says I give it to Jama. This is the story. And Nasiketa goes to Jama's about. Jama is not there. For three days and three nights he waits. Jama comes. Then out of and Jama offers him three boons. The last of which he wants, tell me what happens to a consciousness after the body falls dead. Jama is reluctant to give the answer. But perceives Nasiketa and Jama is obliged to reveal to him the secret of the soul that man does not really die. The real man does not die because real man is not the ego self which is on the surface of our personality. It is the inner being, the soul. But let us see the symbolism of the... Any father can get angry with any son and say, ah, get out, go to hell. Do you think Upanishadic seers will write them down as if that is a very important dialogue? The father, the particular Jagya which was performing was meant for getting freedom from all desires, 
all attachment and everything that he had he was giving away the son knows that father is very very close let us to me the greatest attachment he has for is for me to see to it that he father does not keep the jagya imperfect he goes and tells father whom do you give it give me away when the father says i give it to jamo what he means is i commission you to take a research project discover what's the mystery of death three days and three nights jamo is not there which means three days and three nights nosiketa was concentrating on this particular you see problem what is death and ultimately the revelation comes to him at the end of three days and three nights the soul is immortal open his soul in four bars this is the truth then how to translate into our life next in the series of this quest for immortality we come to markande says brikando has no son she prays for a son to lord shiva in many calendar pictures you will see you see how the popular perception becomes so different from the spirit of a legend myth <laughs> now you will see markandeya holding on to shiva lingam jama is trying to catch him with a kasnik rope and shiva is throwing his trishul and jama is escaping now the truth is like this mrikanda is given an alternative you want a son who will live for 100 years but will be a fool or a son who will live only for 12 years but will be spiritual prodigy a genius what do you want a sense that brikan brikando is he says well i i prefer the second markando is born by the time he is aged 7 he is taking a class on rig vedo of the rishis of the locality he is a grown up and his fame spreads is a wondrous monumental genius 11th year he ends and the father and mother start shedding tears they know one year more and he is no longer with us one day markondo asks them what has happened mikondo tells him the truth then he says leave my destiny to myself don't worry he retires to sonisut just on the eve of the last day of his life he remains concentrated on shiva shiva which means eternity mahakalo it is not the time with a beginning and an end mahakalo the entire eternity is shiva he becomes totally identified with shiva when the moment of death comes and the messengers of god god of death come to collect his soul that don't find any markande the individual markande has been completely marked in eternity there isn't any markande they go back once the time of death passes a new destiny begins when markande comes out of his trance seven rishis are passing by he bows down to them each one of them says live long markande is and do the very very long life next in the series ruru pramod para two young souls the young men ruru and pramod para the girl they are engaged to marry one early morning pramod ruru has gone to the forest to pluck flowers to make a bouquet in those days the best gift one could make out of love was a bouquet of flowers not the diamond and all that now priyam pramod pura is pretending to be annoyed with him because he has left into the forest in darkness is ruru is approaching her pramod pura's face is bright with romance and hope but next moment ruru sees she collapses he comes running and sees a lightning string a snake has bitten her and escaped ruru takes up the body and like a mad person who moves wander around and then to cut short the story god of love comes and tells him here is the secret of her you are entering the nether world where the souls of those who are just dead are still waiting you go there so he goes there to the nether world strikes a bargain with jamo 
half of his life he dedicates to Pramod Bara. With that half of Rudra's life, Pramod Bara comes back to life. So it is a victory of her death, but a compromise, a bargain, and a kind of, well, uh, uh, it, it is just compromise. But then love's role has come into the picture. The God of love has helped. So we know death and life are not opposite to each other. Death is only an absence of life, a particular mode of life. Love and death are each other's enemies. I feel grief for a person who is dead according to the extent of my love for the person. So love and death are opposed to each other. Now comes the last in this series of wondrous meets, Savitri. Far away. You see, again, this very, very interesting thing. It is Markandeva who himself had more of her death. It is from him that we come to know the story of Savitri. When Markandeva in the, in the time of Pandavas exile meets Yudhishthira, Yudhishthira tells Markandeva, have you ever seen a woman of that power like Draupadi? Markandeva says, yes. There was the princess of Matra who was Kanya Tejasvini, a luminous damsel, and narrates the story of Savitri. Savitri was the princess of where is Madhra, modern Afghanistan. India's map has changed, political map has changed. Like Gandhar was Kandahar, the modern Kandahar, Gandhari came from Kandahar. So Madhra and Sollo, the kingdom of Dimotsen, Sattvar's father was Rajasthan. And so, Savitri's story he narrates, how Savitri the Kanya Tejasvini, nobody was able to stare at her even for a moment. That is to say, her personality was so strong, it is not a physical beauty, the personality was so strong that nobody would be daring to befriend her. The father said, you go and choose your own consort. See the freedom the women had in those days. Escorted by a few ministers of the king, he wanders over India. And wherever she goes, she is received with great honor and affection. The princess of King Osupati, the daughter of King Osupati. And then ultimately he meets, she meets exiled Prince Sattvahan. His father has been blind and by intrigue of the politicians of the time, she has been deprived of his kingdom, he's coming and living in the forest. Now, she loves him and promises him that she will come back and bury him. But first she must report to the father. By the time he goes to the father, then Narada also happens to be present there. The eternal, you see, intriguing character Narada, divine straight means and instrument. Now he reveals, my God, Savitra should not marry Sattvan because a year from today Sattvan is destined to die. But Savitra would not listen to it. Nobody knows about this secret of Sattvan's death coming after one year. Savitri goes to the forest, bereft of all ornaments, like a simple village girl, and lives in the hermitage, a heart in the forest where King Dimotsen, his queen, and Sattvan live. Alone she knows the anguishing, tumultuous anguish that is going on in her heart. Day after day, Sattvan's life is being reduced. And the last day has come. She must accompany Sattvan to the forest. Last moment has come. Sattvan feels giddy, sleeps, laying his head on her lap. And all this time, Savitri has been engrossed in a yoga, by parts of which she can see God of death coming and compassionately telling her, let me take away Sattvan's soul. As he does so, Savitri's inner being leaves her own physical sin and follows. The subtle body of Savitri follows. Jama looks back, he's feeling a kind of pull from behind. Savitri, why do you come with me? You know, beyond a certain limit, no being with still a life or earth can cross. Boon after boon after boon in a psychological moment, 
she asks, bless me that I'll be mother of so many children and remain faithful to my husband. Granted, then Jama has been caught. How can I be faithful to my husband whom you are taking away and yet mother become mother of so many children? Jama is obliged to restore Satyavan to life. This is the original story. Now, Savitri's love wins a victory of her death on one individual. The legend was lying torment for centuries on the pages of Mahabharata. But glory to the women folk of India. They observed Savitra Mahavasya for years, for centuries together, a tribute to Savitri's victory over the rules of death. Sorry. And then, <coughs> hundreds of years later, Sri Aurobindo takes up this legend. Sri Aurobindo's epic poem, Savitri, a legend and a symbol. She sees in this legend a symbolic truth that one day one individual's love for another individual had erased death from that individual's destiny. One day the advent of divine love will erase death from the destiny of mankind. Of course, it has to be a refined, a supramentalized, a transformed mankind. That is his vision, Kalki's vision. Mankind has not come to the last rung of evolution. There is still something new to descend and we are to evolve. Dear friends, I think Sri Jasus Kumar Ji had told me, I asked him how long should I say, speak? One hour, I have spoken exactly one hour and I must take leave of you. I am <clears throat> thankful to you, the distinguished celebrities on the dais, you all, busy people, intellectuals, elite of the city, I am lucky to be in your presence. Thank you very much. I am grateful to particularly Razat Babu because but for him there would not be any question of my coming here or my good luck in meeting you. Thank you very much. Thank you.